This story begins on July the 16th, 1945, in the New Mexico desert. The day the world changed. The nuclear age had begun. With this new weapon, America was now the undisputed global superpower. Only the countries who wielded this weapon could sit at the top table of global power and influence, and Britain, having sat there for the past 300 years, was not going to give up her seat willingly. Winston Churchill, confident in Britain and America's post-war special relationship, was sure Britain would have the weapon in her arsenal soon, particularly seeing as Britain's top scientists had contributed a great deal to the completion of the Americans' nuclear project. But having paid what equates to $28 billion in today's money for the bomb, the American Congress was unwilling to share their secrets even with her closest of allies, and passed legislation making it a capital offence to share any nuclear secrets. A bomb of her own. Britain was desperate to regain her seat at the top table and be seen in the world's eyes as the global superpower she believed herself to be. There was only one solution. Britain needed the bomb at any cost and fatefully as quickly as possible. The British government turned to the scientists who had worked so closely with the Americans on developing their bomb and set them to work replicating the science needed so that they could create Britain's own. The deadline to become a nuclear power was set, 1952, the same year it was feared that the Soviet Union would have a bomb of their own and Britain would not be beaten. To build the bomb, one vital ingredient was required, plutonium. And the only viable way to get plutonium was to create it in the core of a nuclear reactor. So in 1947, construction began on Britain's first, in the sleepy seaside town of Windscale in the northwest of England, under the watch of the country's top engineer, Christopher Hinton. The reactor. To create plutonium, first you need uranium. When pieces of uranium are brought together, a chain reaction begins. Neutrons released by the uranium collide with the neutrons from neighbouring rods, releasing even more neutrons. This chain reaction converts tiny pieces of the uranium into the heavier element, plutonium. Unfortunately, the byproduct of this reaction is immense amount of heat that left unchecked can easily become uncontrollable and explode. To protect the uranium from overheating and catching fire, it is sealed in an airtight container made from aluminium with fins that help dissipate the heat. The British scientists had learnt when working with the Americans that the best way to control the reaction was by putting the uranium rods into hundreds of channels drilled into a huge block of pure graphite. This is the core of the reactor. The rods travel through the core of the reactor by being pushed along the channels as new rods are loaded from the front. As it travels along the channel, the nuclear reaction takes place and the plutonium is created. When the rod reaches the end of its channel and the rear of the reactor, it drops into a pool of water where it is cooled and then collected. Whilst the reaction is happening, the core needs to be constantly cooled. Without constant cooling, the core could melt or ignite, causing a nuclear catastrophe. The easiest way to do this is to have a constant stream of water running through each of the core's channels. However, if the water supply fails even for a second or two, the core would run out of control and go into meltdown. This risk was deemed too great, so the British reactor would be air-cooled. Gigantic fans would blow air through and around the core, discharging the heat up 400-foot chimneys at a rate of 2 tonnes per second. As construction progressed on the site, the original 1952 completion deadline seemed more and more unlikely to be met. Christopher Hinton was being put under such immense political pressure to meet the deadline that the facility was being built before the research and design could be properly carried out. One year into construction, a critical design flaw was noticed by one of the reactor physicists, Terence Price. Worried about the speed that the project was moving, he ran through the plutonium creation procedure doodling on a piece of paper, asking himself what might happen if a uranium rod were to catch fire. Price discovered a major design flaw. If one of the rods were to split open and catch fire, the powerful fans intended to cool the reactor would blow radioactive smoke and dust up the chimney out into the atmosphere where it would blow across England and onto Europe. Price's proposed solution was to install air filters to filter out any dangerous radioactive particles that might emanate in the core. However, the chimneys had already been built, meaning the only place to install the filters was at the top of the chimneys, 400 feet in the air. 
Price's concerns eventually reached Nobel Prize winning physicist John Cockcroft, the man in charge of all British nuclear research and development. He recognised the seriousness of the design flaw and backed Price, demanding custom designed filters be installed at the top of the chimneys. This unwelcome delay displeased many senior engineers at the nuclear site and due to their cost, complexity and delay to completion, the filters earned the nickname of Cockcroft's Folly and were viewed with great disdain. The discovery of this fundamental design flaw alarmed Hinton. What other corners were being cut? What safety procedures were being overlooked? Sadly, the bomb was more important to the government than the safety of the reactor. Nevertheless, in 1951, the impossible was achieved and the reactor was turned on only 10 days behind schedule and began to produce the precious plutonium. The stage is set. Although the plant was now producing plutonium, it was soon discovered that because of the way it was designed, it was not producing enough of it fast enough to build Britain's bomb by the deadline. They needed more plutonium, and the only way to do that was to increase the heat in the reactor. The 36,000 aluminium cartridges containing the uranium that had been produced were not designed to create this extra heat. A divisive and dangerous idea was put forward to increase the plutonium output of the reactor. Against safety warnings it was decided due to time constraints that the current cartridges would be modified rather than new appropriate ones being designed. Workers at the plant trimmed off by hand 4.2 millimetres or one sixth of an inch from each of the 432,000 fins, one fin at a time. The task was completed in three weeks and they were reloaded into the core. In 1952 the plant's quota of plutonium had been produced and the British government had their bomb. On the 3rd of October 1952 at a test site in Australia it was detonated. Bye. Unfortunately, while Britain had been attempting to catch up with America, the Americas had been running ahead and developed something far more deadly. The hydrogen bomb. Five, four, three, two, one, two, zero. Ten times as powerful as the now obsolete bomb Britain had worked tirelessly for seven years to complete. Embarrassed the British government, as they had done seven years prior, desperate to reclaim their reputation, now demanded a hydrogen bomb. Countdown to Disaster As the Cold War heated up, a nuclear test ban treaty was agreed upon and would be in place by the end of 1958. Britain needed to have their hydrogen bomb built and tested before the treaty came into effect. To create a hydrogen bomb, not only do you need much more plutonium, you also need tritium to create the explosive yield required. The reactor at Windscale had not been designed to create tritium and was now about to be pushed even further beyond the limits of what it was designed for. New uranium cartridges were designed, however this time they contained enriched uranium and lithium magnesium, a substance that becomes highly flammable when heated. Safety concerns were raised by all the top scientists. The reactor was being pushed beyond its limits on a daily basis. Their fears fell on deaf ears. The plant pushed on and began producing tritium. With the deadline looming, it was discovered again that production was falling well short of what was needed for the hydrogen bomb's production. The plant was ordered to increase output by 500%. Under extreme pressure, the scientists resorted to what they knew had worked in the past and removed even more of the aluminium casing surrounding the nuclear fuel. They also doubled the amount of flammable lithium magnesium in each cartridge to speed up the process. The plant was now operating far beyond any acceptable safety protocols. Christopher Hinton, the man who had built the facility, was given no choice but to resign his post in protest at the flagrant disregard for the safety of his workforce and the safety of the British people. The Inevitable On the 10th of October 1957, Engineers in the reactor's control room noticed a heat spike in channel 2053 within the core. Heat spikes had happened before on several occasions and had been dealt with by what is known as a Wagner release, where the engineers would heat the core releasing any stored up heat within the graphite and then cool the core back down to temperature where it would stabilise. However this time it did not help and the temperature kept rising. Reaching critical temperature the cooling fans were turned on 
Unfortunately, what the engineers didn't know was that the temperature spike was being caused by a fire within the core. One of the modified cartridges being pushed to destruction had split open and the nuclear fuel inside was on fire. When the fans were turned on and began blowing oxygen through the channels, it was like putting a match to paper. The core ignited. Splitting open hundreds of fuel cartridges, the fire reached temperatures of 1,300 degrees Celsius or 2,380 degrees Fahrenheit. The fire burned for three days before eventually being put out. Whilst the fire was burning, a constant stream of radioactive material was being blown up the chimneys and there was a release to the atmosphere of radioactive material that spread across Britain and Europe. The accident was rated at a level 5 on the International Nuclear Event Stage. All milk produced within 800 square kilometres or 310 square miles of the plant was ordered to be destroyed for a month after the fire was extinguished. And sadly, since the accident, 240 cases of cancer have been directly attributed to the fire. Cockcroft's Redemption The unique filters that John Cockcroft insisted were designed and installed at the top of the chimneys were estimated to have caught 95% of the radioactive material that was blown up the chimney. The 5% of radioactive material that was released from Windscale was 1,000 times lower than the total released by Chernobyl. That may not sound like a lot, but for comparison, the Fukushima incident was just 18% of Chernobyl's release. If the filters had not been installed and 100% of the nuclear material had been discharged, Great Britain would look like a very different place today. Entire swathes of land would have become an uninhabitable nuclear wasteland and caused an unknown number of fatalities. The fallout would have then spread onto mainland Europe, causing untold havoc and ruining Britain's relationship with her neighbours. Cockcross Follies prevented a nuclear catastrophe. The incident was a wake-up call and brought home the true danger that working with nuclear material brings. The lessons learnt at Windscale have echoed through the world's nuclear industry. They have influenced the design of countless power stations, safety protocols and fail-safe systems. Helping to make nuclear power by far the safest electrical generation method in the world today. Thanks for watching this episode of Behind Designs. Please make sure to like, share and subscribe.